Hi, I have a question for PZ, which is, why don't the states that have democratic governments put in um, central funding while they have the chance? Oh, well, uh, the Minnesota Miracle is an example of that. Uh, if, you, if you read the history of that, it was a remarkable event because it was bipartisan. That that's what you have to do is you have to get both sides to agree on something, and then you can take action. And most states have very split legislatures. There's lots of competing interests, so it's not as simple as just decreeing. Oh, we'll just do it this way. Yeah, sorry. And just to add to that, um, one of the things that seems to be truly sacred in America uh, education is local control of education. We are just totally wedded to this idea that we do the best when we have local control. Now there's some things that are good about local control of education. Curriculum isn't one of them. You know, there's, there's really no need for this school district to have a different curriculum than that school district. If you move, you may never learn long division, you know, because it was taught at the wrong time. But this idea that local control is best is a very, very strong cultural tradition. So the idea of the state basically taking over is something that's anathema. But it's the kind of local control of education that produces the ridiculous disparities that uh, BZ was talking about. Yeah, and I, I should also mention that it, it also is promoted because it gives minorities, m minority political parties, a chance to greatly influence things. So right now the Tea Party is making a huge push to get people onto school boards. So that's what we're seeing is Tea Party can't win anything at the national level. Um, they can they can get people some people elected to the legislature, but they suffer all kinds of setbacks there. But they just have smooth sailing getting onto school boards because most people don't care. <laughs> right? It's boring, tedious, necessary work. And these people have an ideological drive that gets them onto the school board to start dismantling the public school system. I guess this is for Eugenie Scott. Um, I noticed that a lot of these current um, uh, endeavors have linked climate change as, as one of their things. Could they be shooting themselves in the foot with that? You know, the southern states do seem to be seeing more uh, more of the consequences of, of um, rough weather. And I'm just wondering when those things sort of happen, whether that will erode their, their power base. You know, I noticed that there's a um, a whiteboard back here. I can feel just like a teacher. Um, I, I'd like to I'd like to clear up something because I think a lot of it took me. A, we just started studying climate change a couple of years ago, and we just uh, began the climate change initiative in the spring of this, the, you know, January, February of this year. So we're still doing a lot of learning. But one of the things that I learned is that the climate change issue is very similar to the evolution issue in a lot of ways, but it's also quite different. If you look at, um, if you look at uh, religious conservatives, okay, and you look at political conservatives, you find an overlap that we call the religious right. Everybody understands that, okay. If you look at, if you overlay creationism on this, what you see is that most religious conservatives are creationists. Certainly, the religious right is reliably creationist. This is the creationist. Uh, can't walk and chew gum at the same time, can't write and talk at the same time. The religious right is reliably creationist. Most religious conservatives, but not all, we have evangelicals who accept evolution. They are our best ambassadors to the rest of them. And obviously, political conservatism is not tied to creationism. Let's rewrite this same religious conservatism, political conservatism block with the religious right in between, and let's overlay climate change denial on top of that. When we do that, we find the religious right is reliably anti-climate um, change. But most of the anti-climate change comes from political and economic conservatism. The similarity between anti-creationism and climate science denial is that similar in that it's an ideological view that causes people to close their eyes and stick their fingers in the ears regarding the science. It's a rejection of science based on ideology, but, but the ideologies are largely different. For creationism, the ideology is religious. For climate change, the ideology is largely political and economic. So it's the libertarians, and it's the um, anti-big government people who look at uh, climate change as a liberal plot to try to increase big government whatever. 
um, and, and reject the science as a result of the ideological view. Libertarians reject it because they believe it's an attack on free enterprise, uh, because you're telling the big uh, carbon producers that they have to limit their activities, and so this is anti-free enterprise, anti-capitalism, and so the li libertarians reject climate change as well. It's still an ideological view that is affecting how one views science. Libertarians don't like me saying this, but that's the way it works. So when, um, you know, when uh, uh, Republican, if you find a Republican who rejects evolution, it's probably because he's also a religious conservative. If you find a, um, a religious conservative, a fundamentalist who rejects climate change, it's probably because he's also a political conservative. There's a tiny little bit of... Um, uh, fundamentalist ideology that uh, directly motivates uh, climate science denial, but it tends to be um, a, a small portion of the of the very large number of people who reject climate change. It, it they're rejecting it for um, providential reasons. God's providence would never allow anything bad to happen to the earth, and so forth. So the two issues are really are really rather different. That was a little bit longer answer than probably I should have given, but I think it's a useful thing for people to appreciate. My question is for any of the panelists who would like to weigh in. Uh, do you think it would be feasible to take advantage of the push towards charter schools and vouchers as a way of promoting science education outside of the usual uh, public education system? Yes, and it has been done. <clears throat> Charter schools are very interesting. Charter schools are schools that are um, get some uh, uh, funding from the government, uh, local, of course, uh, but they are uh, they're experimental. They're removed from a lot of the constraints, bureaucratic constraints. So Americans love charter schools. They're also a whole lot of work to set up, and most of them fail financially because it's really hard to support a school. Um, but there are some charter schools that have been started by science enthusiasts. Uh, charter schools are sort of a let a thousand flowers bloom kind of strategy. You get a lot of weeds in there, but you also can get good stuff. I'm, I'm going to disagree. Oh boy, conflict on the panel. I'm going to say no. I think it's a terrible idea. Um, even though, yeah, you can you can find individual char charter schools that are really good. It's like you can find individual homeschoolers who are really good. But my concern is is as a as a social organization like the United States or Canada or any nation, uh, we have a responsibility to more than just the best and brightest. And that's the problem with these sorts of systems, is you set up multiple tiers of, of, of opportunity, and that denies people who have the ability, the opportunity to go. So I, I, I would, I actually kind of, I, I, I'm in this very uncomfortable relationship with a number of people I respect who are homeschoolers, for instance, and I can understand their reasons because a lot of the public schools are really crappy. But at the same time, I want to say you ought to bite the bullet and make the sacrifice for the greater good and support public schools and, yeah, at the same time, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, if it were my own kid in that school, I would, uh, it's, it's such a hard thing. I, I think the only answer is we have to do a better job of funding public schools than the charter schools, the private schools, the homeschooling. That can be a luxury for a few, but really, we're, we're depriving so many minds of opportunities in our country. No, no, I'm, I'm not an apologist for charter schools. Charter schools are legally possible, so, yeah. you know. And they, and some but but I, I agree. I, th I think uh, my major objection for objecting to charter schools is that they frequently are uh, attempts to simply undermine public school education, which I think both of us are quite dedicated to and, and believe should be the primary support. A lot, of the, uh, <clears throat> a lot of the debate when it comes to evolution and creationism uh, goes around the American system and the tools that you have down there with with the First Amendment, which we don't have, and a lot of other countries don't have. What can we do to help, and how can we cooperate over the borders to make the influence that you guys have down there be less up here? Well, well clearly the First Amendment isn't the answer. <laughs> 
it, it, it hasn't solved it for us. I mean, it's a, it's it's really handy in legal strategies. I mean, it gives gives you a strong leg to stand on in the court system. Uh, but we don't. You don't win over hearts and minds in the court system. You've you've got to get to people like you know. Like my first question up there is, how do we inspire how do we inspire citizens to love science? If we could do that, we're done. We win. That's that's the main thing we have to somehow figure out how we're going to do. You know, I I I I loved uh, uh, PZ's talk, and I love his first question. Uh, and and I I'm going to jump in front of you because I think this don't don't go away. You get to ask a question, but not right away, uh, because I think this is a really important question, not just for the U.S. but for Canada and all countries. I don't know any country in the United in the world maybe Singapore, where, you know, there's this huge, huge enthusiasm for science that all of us science fans would like to to see cultivated. But I, I just finished reviewing an, a, a new book that's going to come out shortly that deals with science on television. It was really fun to read and also really depressing. But it, it is worth thinking about um, television, movies, culture, uh, cult ways that the culture talks to one another and, and uh, memes that are important in the culture. Uh, if you're going to get science or art or anything, accounting for crying out loud, you know, if you want to make something popular, you need to tie into those sources of, of, of culture, of, of popular culture. Um, I am struck by how good the television program CSI is in terms of communicating scientific reasoning. You know, the, the, these are these programs that deal with forensics largely. And these, these people are solving crimes by throwing out a number of hypotheses and then gradually eliminating them. That's how you do it. And then they take the last man standing, so to speak, the last hypothesis that hasn't been refuted and solve the crime. It's simplified, obviously, but that's very useful for the public. And interestingly enough, ever since these various forensic programs, CSI and, and Bones and, and these other programs have, have, uh, taken root the last 10 years or so, anthropology courses in American universities have seen this huge burst in enthusiasm for forensic anthropology. And it's all these young women largely, you know, wanting to get graduate degrees <laughs> in, in, in forensic anthropology. And I'm sure it's because of these kinds of popular cultural uh, pressures. We have to figure out, and we're not good at it, this, this book I just read by Marcella Follett will illustrate that very well. Scientists are not very good at, at figuring out how to rework our ideas so that the public finds them instantly engaging. Obviously, the kinds of things that PZ and I are very concerned about, uh, improving science education, making especially elementary K-6 education an active, uh, brains-on, um, experiential kind of phenomenon so the kids as Beasy said, really understand why science is exciting because it's discovery and it's finding, it's, it's using your brain in interesting ways and all that can be very rewarding. We have to do that as well, but we also have to tap into popular culture and we're not very good at it. There's not a CSI, um, um, uh, CSI Los Angeles or uh, LA Law, you know, some, with these kinds of things. Why not um, science uh, uh, LA, you know, have, have scientists be the heroes. And, uh, generally speaking, the science that's communicated on these shows is a little thin. But at least we can get across the way scientists think. And that's maybe the most useful thing. Sorry, I took your. Uh, so if anybody's got an idea for a science, sexy science pilot, <laughs> write the script and get it in there because because we need more of that uh, but I would also mention there's some children's shows that are pretty good I mean the old Scooby-Doo was also I, I know that influenced a lot of people uh, Dora the Explorer mm -hmm. there's Bill Nye the science guy who's still out there fighting the good fight yeah uh, there, there's some good stuff out there so we just need more of it and not just PBS yes yeah yeah, so sexy science pilot. Somebody write it. <laughs> An animated cartoon. Okay, I guess uh, after a clarification from PZ, on, um, on your chart you had um, sort of pure science and you had technicians. I was wondering where engineering fits in there, and isn't that a nice pragmatic area to, to uh, get people interested in? It, it's also 
pays fairly well. Yeah. Or are they Oompa Loompas? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, I, I could get some. I could, I could annoy people so much for that. <laughs> that, yeah, the, the, there, there's not a hard and fast dividing line. And I know doctors who do real biological research, and I know doctors who follow cookbook recipes in order to help people get better. Okay, there, so there's, there's a range there. And I think it's the same with engineers, that there's, there are creative engineers who come up with new solutions, and there are engineers who implement the stuff from the textbooks and make bridges that don't fall down. And, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to disparage these careers in any way. They have a role. Uh, but there is a distinct difference between science and engineering and medicine. And we don't appreciate that enough. Well, you're darn right I have an opinion. <laughs> it's, it, it's one of the main problems we face is that the general public doesn't know the difference between science and technology. And, and science is often sold as... You know, the marvels of technology. We need to invest in science so that we have better iPads and better cell phones and all that sort of thing. That's just crap. That's not what science is all about. Particularly, as I gave you my broad definition of science, it's a way of knowing. Well, building a better iPad is not a way of knowing. And with all due respect to the Watsons, who I hope aren't here anymore, <laughs> uh, <laughs> en engineering is not a way of knowing. It's a way of doing. It's a way of applying scientific knowledge. And until the general public understands that, that, you know, oh, Johnny and Mary, you're really interested in science. You should be a doctor. No. Doctors are not scientists. Doctors do not discover new knowledge. Do doctors do not, as a general rule, uh, do not, uh, in, you know, look for new universal truths and stuff like that. So science as a way of knowing, which remember, as far as I'm concerned, applies to historians and anthropologists and, and whatever, okay, are different than technologies. And we should not. The United States has this massive program in place to, to improve science education, and it's all based on the idea that this will make the United States number one in technology again. Yeah. Okay, so it's all based not on science, but on technology and the anacronym STEM. STEM. Science, great. Technology, engineering, mathematics. The technology engineering is not a way to promote interest in science. It's a way to promote interest in applying science. Okay, so I really think that this is a serious, serious problem where the general public needs to understand the difference between trying to acquire new knowledge and making use of knowledge to improve the human condition. Until we, until we make that distinction, it's going to be really, really hard to get people interested in science. We need to reach the point at which parents say to their son or daughter, oh, you're interested in science, you should be a scientist. Not, you should be an engineer, you should be a technician, you should be a doctor. You should be a scientist and make a career out of this. I I got I've got some problems with that because uh, I'm I'm very aware of the difference between applied science and science, but I don't think that it's quite as crisp and bright as 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 you do, Larry. Um, if you're going, and I also think that technology can be the gateway drug to science. I mean, technology can interest people in science, and that's. Uh, Oh yeah, and medicine, and and so a lot of people get interested. And in, you know, I think people get interested in science mostly through natural history. They they like bugs and spiders, or they like watching stars or something as kids, and and that pulls them in. It's sort of observing nature if you're you know a, a elementary school kid, and that that's kind of what catches you. It's harder if you haven't developed some sort of interest in in nature by the time you're in middle school or high school. It's harder to kind of get hooked on science, although some some do. <laughs> But to, to me, the most important thing that, that I would like my fellow citizens and citizens of the world, of the planet, to understand is how science works, how you use these critical thinking skills that Larry was talking about. Um, 
to understand nature. Uh, we have we have different definitions of sciences, as Larry mentioned. Um, I separate out critical thinking as kind of the bedrock of a lot of, of human intellectual activities, including science. So whereas Larry has critical thing, has, has science as sort of encompassing uh, huge amounts of human knowledge, such as the social sciences, such as science and so forth, um, I have critical thinking as that bedrock which inspires and informs science and um, history and literature and um, theology and lots of other human intellectual endeavors. But science itself is a way of knowing about the natural world. Now, where technology comes in, it is, in fact, applied science. But you have to understand how scientists think. You have to understand scientific reasoning and this idea of testing and rejecting um, the explanations that don't work, tentatively retaining the explanations that do work, rinse and repeat. Um, and this is what engineers do, this is what f good physicians do, if they're not you know, following recipes. Um, it's, it's a critic, it's an applied critical thinking kinds of, kind of phenomenon, which is very parallel to science. Now, maybe people who are physicians and engineers are not publishing articles and making new discoveries about nature, but I don't think that disqualifies them from being, uh, considered scientists. I think if they think like scientists and they apply scientific reasoning in a, um, in the way that that PZ uh, was was describing and, and which I tried to describe a moment ago, um, then I think that that qualifies as science. That said, there's an awful lot of applied scientists out there, and I would also include people in applied agriculture and, and horticulture and things like that. It's also the natural, uh, the biological sciences, natural sciences. There are a lot of people out there in engineering and medicine and agronomy who don't behave very, you know, who, who don't apply scientific reasoning very well. But there are also research scientists who do a crappy jobs. So, you know, I, I wouldn't just apply the term science to the one and ignore it for the other. It depends on how they, how they behave, shall we say. Yeah. Just, can, I, can I just give one of the little da data point here is sort of in between these two positions is uh, I recently got a, a, a major grant award for science education and this involved meetings in Washington DC with representatives from HHMI, NSF and NIH and they sort of agree with Larry I'm afraid. So it's it's not everybody that's that's, that's opposing you, Larry. Um, we, you know, here I've got this grant where I'm trying to develop metrics for whether we succeed in our goals and whether they will renew us. Of course, that's the important thing. And we asked them specifically. Okay, we're we're training these students in college. They're going to go on to graduate school, medical school, dental school, veterinary school, all these things. Which of those count? Which of those make you feel like we've we've achieved our goal of getting people into the science pipeline. And they were quite explicit that no, medical school does not count, neither does veterinary school, neither do engineering schools, that what they specifically want to see is an increase in involvement in graduate programs where they are learning new science. And they want us to be doing more real science in undergraduate. Yeah. So there, there, there is a there is a distinction that's being made, and it's being made at a fairly high level well, now. That's a funding distinction. It's that a funding. Yes. That may not be a definition. Of distinction. Right, but funding. It's an operationally important. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for an interesting discussion. Um, I guess a comment that leads to a question, which is before the issue of tiering came up with the chartered schools, and on that note, or related to it, the idea of having a, a more nuanced understanding of exactly where the education, the scientific prowess of the United States is going. Because although there are numerous problems, we know the United States leads in publications, in certain citations, now maybe not per capita, and maybe because they're certain English and they cite themselves, but I was wondering if you could communicate a bit on that because it does still dominate the world in most, in most citations. Oh, and then yeah. the, the well, final... China's coming up really fast. It is coming up fast, but it's still like, you know, there's 200 countries on Earth, you're still number one. Yeah. And just to provide a, a bit more nuance about that. And then finally, uh, in terms of TV and exposure, The Big Bang Theory is probably the most popular sitcom, or close to it, right? You may not like it, but just a second, just a second. Expectations, right? And then also, House and Sherlock are extraordinarily popular, and methodologically that makes you happy, but maybe not as much you. Thank you. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, yeah, so, you know, House perpetuates a stereotype of the cranky, rambunctious atheist, which I don't like, but, but you're right, <laughs> methodologically. And it's completely yeah, unrealistic. Yeah, it's unrealistic. <laughs> Ex, you know, except for Larry, right. it's, it's, none of us are like that. Um, yeah, uh, the whole idea of measuring our success by publication rates is is problematic. It's self perpetuating that there's all this. Uh, you know, in 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 my work in developmental biology, I I refer quite a bit to a lot of classic papers from the you know before 1950. Um, and it's remarkable. You go back there, what you find is people wrote these things called monographs. That these prestigious, big name scientists who greatly influenced our thinking in developmental biology would go off for two or three years and work on a paper that they would then publish as a monograph. And that's all you'd see from them is every couple of years, there'd be something really substantive coming. And like, uh, Edwin Conklin, for instance, just does this amazing work on, uh, development in Siona. And it's just gorgeous stuff. And, he didn't publish that many papers. And now what we've got is a system where, yeah, if you're not publishing a paper a week, you know, you're, yeah, it's, and, there, and, and a lot of these papers are crap. You know, you mentioned there's a lot of fake journals in China. There are a lot of fake journals in the United States. And discriminating between them is the tough part. Uh, <clears throat> It's quite true that in, in my field in biochemistry and molecular biology, America is the place to be. Our graduate students go and do postdocs in the United States. The, the salaries that Stanford and, 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 and Harvard and, and those top schools can pay are way more than I earn, probably more than PZ earns as well. Uh, the amount of funding that's available, you go, you know, it's not unusual to get a million dollars in startup funds. We can't afford 200,000, we're really stretching our budget. Uh, the amount of grant money that's available is enormous. And so if you send all these foreign countries, send their best postdocs to the United States, the United States then gets to pick and choose the best of them and offer the, the best salaries and the most funding and everything. It's, it's, it's a self-perpetuating thing. The United States is going to remain on top in, in a lot of fields for quite a long time because there's a select number of mostly private schools who have enormous resources to invest in science. And the public systems in Canada and, and in, in Europe, we can't, we can't compete. We simply can't compete with that. So, so if you're a really successful science at the University of Toronto in Canada, and you're eventually going to get an offer, okay, that you, you can't say no to, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's just going to be a factor. But it doesn't mean, of course, as both Ginny and PZ will say that the United States is the number one science literacy country in the world. It just means that at the very, very top notch, you know, top tier, they have a lot of money to spend. You know, they can build $60 million football stadiums and $300 million biochemistry buildings, which, you know, I, I work in a building that was built in 1968. At the school I went to it for, for graduate school, which is an American school, they've already been through three new buildings. The one I was, I worked in was long gone. A new one has replaced that. It's gone. And a new shiny one has replaced that. Okay. That's what private schools have. They have that, that, that kind of money. So the answer is Americans hire all Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> the best Canadians. I'm, I'm very glad that Larry mentioned uh, graduate students uh, and postdocs and foreigners because if you go to just about any uh, laboratory in a big American university, private or state, the biggies, uh, you, you and you take a look at the postdocs, uh, half or more of them are going to be foreign students. And uh, Larry's absolutely right. America has this wonderful top-tier research engine that cranks out patents and cranks out discoveries and cranks out papers. Um, and a tremendous amount of it is on the back of these really bright and energetic and hardworking foreign students who come here from Europe and South Asia and China and Singapore and so forth and so on. The problem with that for America, for the United States, is that that's great and that benefits us, us hugely, but things are getting a whole lot better in India. 
things are getting a whole lot better for research in China. Things are getting a whole lot better back home, and wouldn't you rather be taking all of that wonderful postdoc experience and knowledge that you've gained in the finishing school of the United States, so to speak, wouldn't you rather take that back home where you could be with your family, be in your familiar culture, and be in familiar surroundings, and make your patents and make your dis discoveries in biotech and make your engineering discoveries and so forth and so on in your home country. And this is what's happening. Um, we're going to be having a reverse brain drain, my prediction, of these really, really bright foreign students whom we have so depended upon for this uh, technological and scientific superiority at the top level. But we don't have that pipeline that PZ was talking about. We don't have that pipeline that produces um, shall we say native-born Americans um, of whatever ethnicity or, or national background. We don't have that pipeline to produce the kind of, of scientifically literate and interested and um, trained, trainable students to go into those graduate programs that come from the United States. I'll make this as quick as I can. Um, <laughs> I think Eugenia has answered my question to a certain degree, but how much attention is being paid to curric curriculum development at the lower levels? To, I mean, you need hooks to get people into it. I mean, my science education was absolutely stultifying. And, and, and I just wonder how much curriculum development there has been around early, early scientific development. K, K6 is really the black hole of science education. Um, they're most, most of the teachers who go into K6 go into it because they're interested in literature, social studies, or math. Uh, some go into K6 education because they like science, but we need more of them. Um, but you talked about curriculum. The, uh, the hierarchy of education is you have state science education standards that set out in a very general way. Here's the kind of stuff you should be teaching in various disciplines, history, literature, uh, science. Um, but then the general guidelines are taken to the local district. It's the lo local district that determines curriculum. Um, and again, local control of education means that you have this incredible patchwork of things that is that are taught sometimes in you know, adjacent districts, they'll, they'll be, they'll have quite different curricula. Um, but that said, th there are signs of, of encouragement on the horizon for, but again, remember how big the United States is. There are something like 15,000 separate school districts. That's a lot. And so because it's such a huge cultural institution, like any battleship, it's going to turn very, very slowly. Um, probably 20 or maybe even 30 years ago, um, efforts had, were made largely by physicists, but secondarily by a biologist, to try to instill inquiry learning, um, the kind of hands-on experiential science education, rather than what we're doing, which is lecturing, which is the dumbest way to transmit information. Um, but to try to transmit these more experiential uh, uh, education approaches at K-12, um, well, at K-6, middle school, and high school as well. Um, gradually, this has seeped into the textbooks, but it still needs more seepage, so to speak. You need to retrain teachers to do this, which means the university um, uh, education curricula, uh, education people have to be thinking about this. Most, most university science classes are still taught in the lecture format, so do as I say, not as I do. Um, we can't really expect teachers to apply this new method of, of thinking and reasoning unless they're being modeled that sort of uh, teaching um, approach by their university professors. So I, I always come up and kick the university professors when you know I talk about this. Um, but it's been very slow. But I'm very encouraged when I go to science teacher conferences and I talk to teachers because a lot of them, of course, the ones who go to the conferences are, you know, the most professionally motivated and the most, you know, the the the, the cream. But there's an awful lot of effort to try to uh, show students how to think like a scientist, um, depth over breadth. But of course, this is this is being thwarted by other pressures. Like I say, this battleship is hard; it's very slow to steer and very hard to, to turn. Other pressures like these damn state exams that are 
promoted by the No Child Left Untested um, education law that we passed in the early 2000s. Um, those are requiring, you know, breadth over depth. And so it's very difficult for teachers to find that balance because they're being held accountable on one hand for some very difficult performance objectives for kids. But on the other hand, they know the kids really need to have this more in-depth approach to learning how science works uh, rather than just memorizing a bunch of things that you can fill out in a bubble uh, test. I, I want to emphasize uh, one point that uh, was just made, that <clears throat> there are multiple ways to solve this problem. Okay? But one of the issues, one of the things that I think I can do is change the way university courses are taught. They're absolutely horrible. University, we, we, have, we have captured a bunch of intelligent people for four years, and when we graduate them, they're usually not any more scientifically literate than when they started. And that's because we still, unfortunately, do this, you know, lecture, didactic. You know, the students in our bio biochemistry courses in my own department have to memorize the enzymes, the glycolytic cycle, and stupid trash like that, that no, no expert in pedagogy says is valuable or useful. But I cannot convince my colleagues to change their mind. And so we are... PZ and I, we, we are we are a good part of the problem. The the the, <laughs> the one the one the time when we should be really turning out potential teachers and lawyers and politicians who are educated in science, we could actually you know they could graduate from grade twelve and not have learned a lot of science, but we have a chance to fix that and we're not doing it. So. We could do a hell of a lot better job, but I don't know what kind of resistance PZ meets, but, but I can't convince my colleagues that they really should teach science properly. Yeah, well, there's there's different perspectives on this too, and I, you know, I, I kind of agree. But I'm I'm at a small university, and we can be fairly nimble about these sort of things. And there's a lot of enthusiasm for new teaching methods, so we do try that. But here's the thing that really holds us back, and that is the public school system that we're still dealing with a group of students who come in knowing next to nothing, in many cases having negative information that we have to correct. And while we can we can be enthusiastic and try these novel techniques in our upper level courses where we're where we can actually get into questions and get students to respond because they finally we finally broken through their ignorance barriers, in our introductory courses that th it often falls flat because You've got a mix of students, some of whom don't understand basic algebra. Try teaching a little introductory population genetics to students who don't know algebra. It's, it's agony. And it, it often means that you have to stop the flow of the class and address really basic problems in order to get them to the point where they actually understand what kinds of questions you're asking. It's, it's a difficult situation. So we have, we have to improve it at all levels, and then, then we'll, there'll be magical synergy, and we'll all do marvelous jobs, right? Right. But you can grab us afterwards. Um, as far as science... Not literally. <laughs> <laughs> sure, me, I can do that. <laughs> can we choose? <laughs> as far as science in the popular culture goes, um, interest in football in Texas is an immovable object. Uh, would you, we be better served trying to integrate interest in science with other interests that people already have instead of trying to remove interest from those areas? Like, would a, a $60 million football stadium be as bad if it were a $50 million stadium with a $10 million sports science center attached to it? We could we could take advantage of this. We could have all kinds of interesting lesson plans about gelatinous objects and bony cat crania, and what happens when they bounce off of things. We, th there's real physics and biology that are, could be studied there, um, and statistics. Oh yes, t epidemiology of traumatic brain injury and football. Yeah, there's lots of things we could do with this. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it is it's a it's a problem. It's the same problem we have with religion though. That here's something that's immovably standing in the way of science, but that people really, really love and are attached to. And it's really hard to go in there and say, well, 
Texans, no more football for you because we got priorities. Just like it's really impossible to go to an American and say, well, no religion for you because we've got other things you'd rather, we'd rather you do. And I don't know what to do about that. Well, you go, you, you reach people where they are. And so if, so if a kid is just really nuts about football, if a kid is nuts about baseball, one thing that baseball just overdoses on is statistics. And, you know, that's maybe you can help that student understand, no, just because so-and-so, uh, the batter gets, uh, uh, gets on base once and one in four times, the fact that he struck out three times doesn't mean the next time he's going to get on base. And, you know, you might be able to help that person, that kid understand a little bit more about statistics using something he's interested in. You know, I, I mean, get him hooked on Stephen Jay Gould. That's, that's easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for a baseball fan, that would a fellow traveler, so to speak. Um, and there's, you know, there's lots of physics involved in sports. That might be that might be a way of interesting some kids. Um, some uh, uh, Sarah Mayhew is here. She's interested in art. Well, she got interested in science because there are reflections of science in art that you can see. I mean, there's a lot. You reach people where they are. That would be what I would suggest. Well, thank you to everybody for all your questions and your participation, and thanks to our speakers.